Zima Board is the flagship project from a company named Ice Whale Tech. The Zima Board was crowdfunded in 45 days with 1,880 backers and over $300,000 raised. It differs from other single board computers in that it is x86 based instead of ARM based like the Raspberry Pi. The Zima Board 832 is the highest offering from Ice Whale and packs some fairly impressive specs for an under $200 all-in-one device. The heart of the system is an Intel N3450 CPU with 4 cores and 4 threads. It uses integrated Intel HD Graphics 500, has 8GB of LPDDR4 and 32GB of eMMC storage. All of this runs at a TDP of a measly 6 watts. It has dual gigabit Ethernet, two USB ports, support for two SATA devices, but only comes with one connector, and PCIe expansion. It also uses a mini display port to connect to a monitor. Luckily, I had a cable that came with my monitor. I will be using a powered four port USB hub to allow for extra peripherals. Wow, this thing is compact. It is pretty amazing that they can jam all the components of a basic computer into this size. It is not much bigger than a 2.5 inch SSD. I also think it looks pretty cool. It appears to be made out of quality materials that not only look good, but are also durable. After reading the specs, I thought, what the hell can I use this for? Some common uses are for a personal cloud, software router, a file server, a retro gaming box, and even a Minecraft server. While all of that is very impressive, I don't really find any of these applications useful to me specifically. I use my PC for all of my content consumption, so I don't need a server to stream my media to multiple TVs or devices. So what will I do with this thing? I followed the quick start guide and everything worked immediately. Except when trying to update the native Casa OS, I couldn't seem to get it to process the update. You can use Casa OS to navigate the Zima board remotely across the network. Casa OS was designed in-house to be a decentralized cloud server software. There's a lot of different apps you can install on here, everything from Jellyfin to Piehole. I hooked up a 10 terabyte external hard drive to see if it could be used for file hosting. I was able to browse through the files and play a movie over the network fairly easily. Since I'm not much of a Linux user, I decided to see if this hardware could handle Microsoft's most popular bloatware, Windows 10. I got a 1TB Samsung 870 EVO 2.5 inch SSD from Amazon Warehouse for 28 bucks to install Windows on and test the SATA capabilities. Before using this SSD, I checked the smart data and discovered that it had nearly 4 months of power on time and 110 power cycles. I guess I shouldn't be surprised, but someone used this thing well beyond the return period and Amazon just tapes up the box and sells it at a discount. I haven't had any issues with it, but it was certainly used heavily. Windows installation was pretty painless. It installed easily off of a USB flash drive with no hiccups, although quite a bit slower than I'm used to. I ran a speed test to see if I was getting appropriate speeds and the results were odd. For some reason, I was getting different results with every test. The first time I ran it, speeds were at around 160 down and 180 up. Then on consecutive runs, it started going up higher and eventually it hit around 500 up and 200 down. For reference, here is a speed test from my PC that represents the 1500 megabit down, 200 megabit up that I pay $120 a month for. I wondered if CPU load has an effect on the networking ability. I repeated this test a few more times in the future and came to the conclusion that it was likely the CPU load affecting the bandwidth of the network interface card. Now let's have some fun and run this thing through the ringer. Let's see what this thing can do in Cinebench.
took about five minutes just to decompress the Cinebench file, so hopefully it won't take too long to actually run the benchmark. After the longest Cinebench run of my life, it received a pitiful multi-core score of 600. With only four cores and four threads, you really can't expect too much now. My next grand idea? Furmark. After 30 minutes of Furmark, the CPU temperature was hitting 77 degrees, but didn't appear to skyrocket too much further. You could feel it getting hot to the touch as the passive cooling was getting its workout. I think the cooler is sufficient enough for long duration, high demand applications, but could probably benefit from a fan moving some air over the heatsink. Now that we got that out of the way, let's see if it can game. I think a good starting point is the first video game I ever owned. Super Mario World for SNES. I hooked up a generic PS4 controller via USB with no issues. The Super Nintendo games run very well, no lags or frame drops. Can't say the same for my skills. Here's one of my favorite games back in the day, GoldenEye 64. This game is also very playable, but I learned that trying to use a PS4 controller with N64 button mapping is really confusing. Emulation seems to work pretty well on here, so let's try an old PC game and see how it does. Portal was released in 2007. Aside from a few slowdowns, the game ran fairly well, showing that the Zima board can handle some light retro gaming. Okay, so it doesn't have much processing power. It's mediocre at gaming, but let me share what it is good at. It is easy to set up and start using relatively quickly. More advanced operations will definitely take some time, but you could set it up and start sharing files on your network within a few minutes. It offers great expandability by supporting SATA and PCIe out of the box. It is very compact, quiet, and efficient. This thing only uses about 12 watts and only gets warm to the touch. For its cost at $200, it is in a tough pricing spot. It could be the perfect balance of price to performance for many use cases. But if you don't have strict size restrictions, in the $200 to $300 range, you can find a slightly larger mini PC that will offer modern hardware and much more power for use as a personal computer, and even handles some entry-level gaming a little better than this can. But this thing is perfectly good as a mini PC to use on the go if you have all the accessories needed to set it up. With an HDMI to display port adapter, you could hook this thing up to any monitor or TV. With a USB hub, you can attach as many peripherals as you need, like headsets, controllers, mice, and keyboard. It seems to accept all of these with no problem. Browsing the internet, it seemed to do fine. The CPU gets maxed out fairly easily, but it wasn't much of a problem as long as Windows isn't updating. One of my only complaints about the Zima board is a lack of a power switch. This means that you have to unplug it and plug it back in to turn it on. Not a deal breaker, but it can be a little annoying. In conclusion, this thing is crippled by an 8-year-old CPU. But if you're looking for an x86 based micro PC that can run simple tasks while being completely silent and ultra compact, then the Zima board is exactly what you're looking for. The biggest thing it has going for it is its size, silence, and versatility. You can easily build a $200 server out of used parts that will be way more powerful, but it will be significantly larger and louder. With its small profile and wide array of connectivity, I am sure many people will find the Zima board a very useful tool for their server needs. Beer. Zima.